So it's time for part two. We're going to take a totally different direction. No longer talk about sequences, but talk about learning to compare examples. So this is, is a pretty big area. Um, some people talk about distance metric learning. Some people talk about similarity learning. I really am not going to give you a comprehensive introduction to similarity learning or distance learning. There are a lot of methods out there. It's a huge field, as I said. But um, I'm going to talk about methods that are inspired by deep learning and representation learning. So it's kind of my, my take on the area, um, you know, not just my work. I'll talk about a lot of other people's work. Um, and just like in my first talk, I, I will talk about some applications. Again, we'll talk a little bit about human pose estimation, um, doing retrieval of uh, finding images of people in similar pose. Um, we'll also talk about some things like matching documents. And then uh, at the end of the talk, I'll, t I'll introduce a Dutch progressive electro band called Simon and Kipsky. Um, so you have to stay for the end of the talk, though, to, to hear what that's all about. So, OK, so the outline will go as follows. We'll talk about um, unsupervised techniques. So you don't have any idea of the, the structure that you'd like to learn in terms of your mapping um, from inputs to the space in which you, you compute distances or similarities. So these are methods like uh, latent semantic analysis, um, semantic hashing, which Jeff briefly talked about. So we'll go from one extreme to another. We'll, we'll talk next about supervised methods. So these are methods that use some maybe labels associated with your data or even um, an arbitrary neighborhood graph. And this is used to inform your embedding. And then in the last third of the talk, we're going to talk about sort of hybrid methods. What do you do um, when you have some information available that can inform your embedding, but you don't have an explicit neighborhood graph? All right, so it's been said already in this tutorial that defining distances in terms of pixels is not the same as semantic similarity. In fact, pixels are very bad for giving you meaningful distances. They're also usually very high dimensional, and so it's computationally expensive to compute distances in pixel space. So um, the, the pictures that I have here are people, as you can all pretty much see, are in, in similar poses. And what I'm trying to get at here is we'd like to train a system that can recognize that these people are in similar poses and ignore the fact that they have very different backgrounds or lighting conditions. Some people have masks or sunglasses on, men and women, different clothing, and so forth. These are all what we call distracting factors um, or input variability. And we'd like to train systems that are invariant to these factors and, and hone in on, on what we feel is important, or what we call the semantic similarity, and that's the human pose. So again, I'm going to say that the, the, the methods I talk about are general in nature, but this is going to be the, the example I keep coming back to is human pose. OK, so let's start talking about the unsupervised approach. So we're going to learn, this is, a, this is a summer school on deep learning, so we're going to maybe have deep representations that are learned completely unsupervised. And these are going to compute uh, codes in some usually lower dimensional space. And we'll compute distances in the space of codes that these, these deep networks have produced. And we're going to hope that computing distances in this space are more semantically informative than the original representations. Okay? Um, the reason that they're going to be usually low dimensional is just that they're fast to compute. And there's the extreme of hashing in which you don't even have to, to really compute distances. You just flip some bits and get nearby neighbors. Um, so classical methods like latent semantic analysis, which is, it was based on a singular value decomposition, um, and the probabilistic variant of it, and also something called latent Dirichlet allocation, these are directed models. And as has been said before, um, Directed models have a problem in that inference, exact inference, is, is often tricky to do because of this problem of explaining away that, that Jeff talked about. And in the area of retrieval, trying to find nearby examples and so forth, fast exact inference is very important, right? So let's think about using undirected models where inference is, is exact and fast. So Max Welling and, and colleagues 
were, I think, the first to apply RBMs to doing information retrieval. And uh, they generalized the RBM to different types of uh, visible uh, distributions, conditional distributions. So they generalized it actually to the whole exponential family, and they could have things like RBMs that model um, word counts. So they have Poisson RBMs and Gaussians and um, other members of the, the exponential family. And recently, Russ Salkunov and Jeff Hinton have taken a, a multi-layer approach, um, again, based on RBMs, and they call this semantic hashing. So just like there is a portion of my first talk which overlapped a little bit with Jeff, this portion of the talk is going to also overlap a little bit with Jeff's talk, um, but it sets the stage for the, the more complicated things we're going to talk about. So in, in semantic hashing, uh, they, the idea is you have an RBM here that has a special type of uh, distribution defined over the visible variables given the hiddens. Hiddens are just binary, as, as you've seen many times before already. But we call this constrained Poisson distribution. And basically, um, the idea is that this, this distribution is normalized by the number of words in a particular document. So we're going to have documents. We count the words in the documents. So we have these word counts. And we want to model them. And basically, this is normalized in the way that the mean word rate across the document sort of sum up. Um, so these, 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 these units are representing words, right? So the mean rate is defined by this, this Poisson sums up to be basically the number of words in the document. So that's, that's n that you see here. And so one way of thinking about it is to sort of like normalized uh, Poisson, or you can just basically divide all your, your word count um, observations by the number, total number of words. And so you get something that looks like a distribution here. And so when you go up to infer the features, you have to multiply by the total number of words. And when you come down to get a, a distribution, so now you have just a distribution over words given your hidden variables, right? So you would sample a word, and then if you want to build a document, you just have to sample this thing many times. So this is sort of the basic building block of semantic hashing. Um, as you've seen before, you can learn this model sort of greedily on some word count data. Then you can train one or more binary to binary RBMs on top of it to stack them. You train these with contrastive divergence in a greedy fashion, and then you unroll this to a deep autoencoder. And we'll see a picture of that in a second. And you fine tune it with backprop to produce a good deep autoencoder. The trick here for semantic hashing, Jeff told you it was very fast, but he didn't tell you the, the trick to training this thing. And it's basically, during the fine tuning of the autoencoder, you add Gaussian noise to the innermost layer, the code layer that you're going to work with to search for documents. And this forces the codes to be close to binary. So they do sensible things when you actually threshold them. So in the, in the autoencoder, you have you know, sigmoid units. They're not, you know, they're not actually binary. They produce values between 0 and 1. But by adding the Gaussian noise, it makes their activations close to binary. So it's not you know, really harsh when you, when you actually threshold them in the end. So you build this deep autoencoder. Documents get mapped to 20 d binary codes. And then you can retrieve nearby neighbors basically with no search, right? So you have a, a radius which re represents sort of the, the maximum number of bits you want to flip in your code, and that will return your nearby neighbors. If you try doing this binary thresholding trick with latent semantic analysis, it doesn't really work very well, because it hasn't been trained like this uh, deep autoencoder. It's, it's not, it hasn't been really optimized to make, make the binary codes work very well. So, you know, you can see this embedding produced by this method on documents, and it seems, you know, if you do, it hasn't been trained with these class labels, but you can use the class labels to color the embedding. And by plotting sort of 2D codes produced by this, it seems to separate reasonably well um, the different document types. But there's a weakness with this model, and that's basically that even though documents with similar addresses have similar content. So this, you know, when you're doing the lookup, it gives you back good documents. This doesn't mean that the converse is true. So it doesn't mean that different documents that are similar get mapped to similar points in the code space. So maybe we can use some external information, let's say in, the, in the terms of labels that we have, to inform the embedding and pull together the codes of similar documents. So we'll be talking a bit about that. OK, so I'm going to talk about a method called neighborhood components analysis. And, and I've seen Sam Royce talk about this before. And the way he motivates this is via k-nearest neighbor classification, something a lot of you have maybe heard about. So 
You know, when you're doing k-nearest neighbor classification, you have an example here, it's an x, and you want to figure out its class. Here, just black or white. So you query a fixed number of neighbors, and you vote on the class of x given these neighbors. Um, so k-nearest neighbor, you have to have two things to find. You need a number of neighbors that you use, so k, what's k? And then you also have to have the distance metric that you use to compute your nearest neighbors, right? And usually we just assume this is Euclidean, but you could actually use many different types of, types of dis distance metrics. You could select from a discrete number of distance metrics available to you, or you might parameterize your distance metric and try to optimize those parameters to give you a better metric. So obviously the right distance metric to use for K and N classification is really the one that optimizes test error. But, you know, it's, we, we can't really optimize our performance on our, on our test set, so we're going to think about approximating this by using the training error. And let's think about this by leave one out cross-validation. So we're going to flip through each point in our training set and try to adjust our distance metric so that K nearest neighbor for each point in our training set does a good job, okay? So there's two problems with this. One is that and the, probably the biggest one is that this leave one out error, um, that using this as an objective function, is a very highly discontinuous function of the distance metric. So you, know, you manipulate the parameters of your distance metric, you recompute nearest neighbors under that distance metric, and maybe nothing happens. And then you go back and uh, make some changes to your distance metric, evaluate your neighbors, and now your neighborhood sh structure totally changes. And new guys are your neighbors. Your, your, say your set of five nearest neighbors have been totally replaced. And this spikes your leave one out error. And so you can imagine this is not something that's very nice to optimize because it's highly discontinuous. And the other problem that's still kicking around is that we need to choose k, right? So the idea of neighborhood components analysis is to look for a smoother, or at least continuous, cost function instead of the true leave one out error. So this trick has actually been used in stochastic neighbor embedding and a few other places. And um, it's a nice trick because um, it allows us to come up with smooth cost functions that are differentiable. And instead of picking from a fixed set of k nearest neighbors, let's select one neighbor stochastically. OK, so we're going to take a point. We're going to compute distances using our current setting of the metric to all of its all the other points, and then we're going to choose a neighbor. We're going to choose one neighbor based on the distance between our point i and all the other points j, right? So we're going to use the distances, we're going to normalize them through a softmax, and that's going to give a probability of points j being i's neighbor, right? So you have probability for each point j, whether they're the neighbor, and then we're going to pick one. And um, this distance it's easiest to think about computing the distance in terms of codes that have been produced through some mapping. So this mapping could be linear, just could be basically multiplying x by a matrix, or it could be something more complicated like a neural net. Right? So we take our input, we apply some mapping to it, we compute some distance, and then we have uh, basically distances between i and other, i other points j. Right? We select that neighbor. So what does a loss function look like when we're doing this stochastic neighbor selection? Well. What we want to do is basically put all the probability mass on guys that are in the same class. Right? So we put all the mass on guys that are in the same class. So why are the labels? They match up. So you know, all the probability mass are on same class examples. This means that we can't make an error when doing this stochastic neighbor selection. Right? If we start putting probability on mass that are, that are on guys in different classes, then there's some probability of getting an error. Right? So that's the thing we want to maximize. We're just finding a loss, so we're just going to minimize it instead. And we're going to do this. We said with sort of uh, cross-validation, leave one out. So we're going to sum this over all the points. And the nice thing of this is uh, it's actually differentiable with, with respect to the parameters of the mapping. Right? So mapping, we're going to call these parameters theta. And we can use SGD or some other gradient-based optimizer to solve for the parameters of our mapping. And I won't go into a whole bunch of detail about this. There's no explicit parameter k anymore. Um, the, the, the number of neighbors you effectively use is actually defined sort of by the scale of the, the, the distances and, and, and the parameters. So it actually kind of selects the, the right number of effective neighbors to use. OK, so NCA, in its classical form, uses a linear mapping. 
So the function is just multiplying x by this matrix. Usually this thing um, is low rank. So here we're mapping different dimensionality data sets, like three dimensions, 13 dimensions, so forth, to two dimensions. So um, you can see that PCA, which is totally unsupervised, uh, then we have uh, linear discriminant analysis. So we've, there's unfortunately two th well-known things that are called LDA. Uh, so this is linear discriminant analysis. And here is na neighborhood components analysis. So you see it produces fairly nice embeddings in which the true classes are well separated on these toy data sets. Now, if we use a more sophisticated or high dimensional data set with more examples, things aren't bad, but they get a little bit messy. Um, and this is just MNIST. So 784 dimensions, we've embedded it to 2D. So maybe we can go um, do a little bit better than just linear NCA. Well, the original MCA paper points out that this mapping from X, the input, to code space doesn't have to be linear. Right? It doesn't have to be a matrix. It can actually be something like a neural net or even a, a deep neural net. So um, this is pointed out by Salakutnov and Hinton. And um, what they do is the, the thing they, they got really used to doing in about 2006, 2007, which is pre-training with an RBM and then fine-tuning with uh, using an N NCA objective. And so um, they also realized that it might be beneficial to combine the NCA cost, which we just talked about. So this is sort of you know making sure you're, you're, the guys in your same class lie close together in the embedded space, and the autoencoder loss, which is making sure that you're able to reconstruct the inputs once you've moved down to a low dimensional space. And if you use this combined um, kind of cost, the thing you can do is take advantage of unlabeled data. So if you have a data point that doesn't have a label, you can't really apply the NCA objective, but you can certainly apply the, the autoencoder objective. So you can do some sort of semi-supervised learning. All right, so this is kind of the picture of uh, the non-linear NCA setup. You have an RBM. Uh, if it's MNIST, you know, it's just like a, a binary to binary RBM. You train several RBMs in a greedy type setup. And uh, you have a top layer RBM, which has pretty low dimensional codes. And so you can do relatively quick distance computation and in that space. And then you basically have, I've shown, or this is taken from Russ and Jeff's paper, they've shown two identical networks here in which they're picturing that the codes for guys in the same class are being pulled together through the NCA objective. Right? So NCA is pulling on these guys to be similar 30-dimensional codes. But we also have the autoencoder loss acting on the reconstructions right? and then back propagated. So not only does it pull uh, codes for guys in the same class together, it makes sure it can reconstruct them through this, uh, this sort of over and complete expansion and dimensionality reduction there. OK, so you know, NCA, this nonlinear NCA, looks a lot nicer for MNIST than did just the simple linear NCA. Um, but there's still some issues. So basically, NCA has this quadratic uh, normalization term, right? You're considering all other points j when you're doing this stochastic neighbor selection, right? So you need to compute distances with all the other points in your set. Now, you can sidestep this issue um, by just using mini-batch training. And because we're just using, generally, uh, gradient descent, it's pretty resilient to these types of things. You just take 100 points and, and compute the, the probability of you know, those 100 points of being neighbor to your, your current point for each point in your uh, mini-batch. And then you can also look at, and we'll talk about this next, is sort of objective functions that don't require normalization. And then also, uh, there's the issue of continuous labels. And this is actually pointed out in the NCA paper that you can use a soft form of NCA that uses continuous labels instead of class labels. OK, so let's talk about Siamese networks. So the idea of a Siamese network is that you're going to have two identical copies of the same, uh, say, neural net. This could just be, again, a linear mapping. It could be a five-layer net. It could be a seven-layer net, whatever. It could be a convolutional net. But you have some mapping to go from input space to some code space. And usually that code space is 
low dimensional because you want to compute distances in it. And you want to force this distances for similar, semantically similar examples to be small, right? And then you basically want to force this to be big distance in code space for guys that are you deem are not semantically similar, right? So it has sort of a pushing and pulling effect. This idea of um, Siamese networks is, is not new. It's been kicking around for a while. And you see an example here from 1994, um, something that Jan uh, worked on for basically doing signature verification using a Siamese architecture. This is actually convolutional um, in 1D. And this thing verified whether two signatures were um, from the same person or legit, or there was a forgery. And this was developed, um, I believe, at, at Bell Labs or maybe AT&T. Um, now, Jan says that they didn't quite get this uh, objective function right. And um, I think they used a cosine distance. And it was kind of unstable to train. And the training set sort of by today's standards is relatively small, but it worked reasonably well. And um, I guess in the 10 years following that, they kind of nailed down the, the objective function, we'll, and we'll, we'll talk about that. So um, you've already heard about convolutional net. So a quick review, convolutional net, we have a filter bank, nonlinearity, feature pooling, and another filter bank, nonlinearity, feature pooling, and re re repeat that number of times. And typically, you're going to have some, say, output, like a classifier output. But here, we're going to replace the classifier output with just a real valued code. And that is going to represent the structure of our Siamese network. So uh, for the remainder of, of this discussion, I'm going to assume that our mapping is through a convolutional network. So we're going to take images here. Say these are images that we want to make have, have similar codes. So we're going to put these two images here. They're going to be processed by identical convolutional nets. And we're going to compute their distances in this low dimensional code here. And basically, I want to pull this code together for guys that should be similar and pull it apart for guys that shouldn't be similar. So what's the objective function? So there's something called, um, it's a real mouthful. It's called dimensionality reduction by learning and invariant mapping. And um, the short form is Dr. Lim. And this was, uh, this objective was proposed back in 2006, um, again from the NYU group. And it's an objective function that has two terms that explicitly do what we've been talking about. It has a term to push together similar examples and pull apart dissimilar examples. Um, but there's a, a little bit of a nuance here. So the, the similarity term is very easy. So S here is a binary indicator. It tells us whether Xi and Xj are neighbors. This is predetermined through labels or some other explicit means of identifying points in our training set as being neighbors. And for guys that should be neighbors, when they get far apart, you know, this, is this, this axis is their distance. They get far apart, we're going to penalize them. right? So the penalty grows as our similar the guys that are supposed to be similar, their distance grows. Now, um, in terms of the similarity loss, what it's going to do is penalize in the same uh, quadratic way guys that get very close by that are supposed to be dissimilar examples. right? But here's the trick. After a certain distance, we don't care about guys that are supposed to be dissimilar. Once they get far enough away, we don't try to pull them away or anything like that. And I, I think that's um, one of the things that wasn't so good about that, that signature verification um, uh, model was that it sort of kept on trying to pull these guys apart. So basically, Jan has a nice analogy for explaining this, and this is through springs. So, Basically, you think uh, you have a point here, and you, just, you have points that are deemed to be similar through some neighborhood graph. And these arrows represent the forces acting on those springs. So these guys are all going to be pushed to be close to your center point, because they should be similar. And then you have the hollow circles referring to points that should be pulled away. But you'll notice that the hollow circles outside this radius, which represents your margin, there's no forces acting on them, because we don't really care about them. Okay. So this method is really good for producing nice pictures. Um, you have the, a, a subset of NORB. You've seen NORB already in, in the summer school. This is synthetic images where the, uh, we've controlled the conditions under which they've been captured. So we have different azimuths, different elevations, different lightings. 
And this uh, particular example of doctrine was only applied to the airplanes um, in NORB. And you'll see that it's, it's, been, it's learned a three-dimensional mapping. And you'll see, uh, I should say here that the neighborhood graph is very explicit. So basically they said, other images are your neighbors if they're two or one azimuth away, or if they're one elevation away, or if they're the same image but just under a different lighting condition. Right? So this is, this is given to the network to define similarity. And then it learns an embedding. And it's basically in 3D, it's this sort of cylindrical structure. And around the circumference is the, the azimuth. Um, if you look at sort of, if you flip it on its side and, and, and go down the height of the cylinder, you have elevation changes, right? Going from, from like a top level view to a side view. And so it produces a nice uh, sort of semantic embedding. You'll also see here that there's like little clusters of six points, and those are referred to the same uh, object, same azimuth and elevation, but different lighting conditions. So this produces really nice pictures, but one thing I would say that is, is maybe slightly annoying here is that we've had to put a lot of information into the, the embedding by defining explicitly what the neighbor should be. And, and we can do this because it's a synthetic data set, essentially. So um, what do we do when we don't have an explicitly constructed neighborhood graph? NCA and Dr. Lim, have we've seen, have re relied on this. And we could ask people to do this for us um, in terms of labeling tasks. But in terms of defining pairwise similarity, it's kind of difficult. And it's inconsistent across observers. So here's, here's an example. We have two images. You see these two people here. And probably most of you would agree that they're in different poses. But what about the second and third image here? Um, or sorry, the first and third image here. You look at the first and third image, they both have their hand up. So we probably say they're, you know, they're similar, but it's tough to define sort of a binary similarity of them being neighbors or not neighbors, right? So the other thing we could do is go out on the web and, and use crowdsourcing techniques like Amazon Mechanical Turk to get people to give us images of people in similar pose. But you know, this is expensive to do, even though these crowdsourcing platforms are available. So what are some other ways we can do this? Well, we could use synthetic data. Other people have used it, like um, Shaknarovic, um, in, and uh, others have basically used, for human pose, graphics models that can take body layouts and generate images that look like people using realistic rendering techniques. But this doesn't really generalize to real settings. Like We like to work on basically videos that we get off YouTube, kind of noisy, realistic uh, videos. Another solution which we applied in the context of analyze, analyzing the body language of politicians is to ask people to label the heads and hands. So I'll show you this interface that's been developed by a student at NYU named Ian Spiro. And this is a very easily excitable guy named um, Vladimir Zernovsky. And you can see a person on Amazon Mechanical Turk labeling, using Ian's interface to label their hand and head pose. And the idea here is that we're going to use just the location of the head and the hands as a proxy to understanding more about the body language of that person. OK, so that tool is available. So we can go out and get basic pose information, basic pose label. And these are real valued. So now we have a database of people. Their heads and their hands are labeled. We'd like to now train a method that will map guys in similar pose to nearby locations in a low-dimensional space. Okay? And then vice versa. Take guys that are in different poses and, and map them far away in this space. So once we've learned this mapping, how do we, how do, we do uh, pose estimation? Well, we take a query point. It's unlabeled. We find its nearest neighbor using our learned embedding. And then we're just going to copy the pose. So just copy the pose from the nearest neighbor, or we could use several nearest neighbors and aggregate their poses, right? Um, so we need our nearest neighbor to look at to be quick, so we've got to work in a low dimensional space. And kind of the point I've been hammering here is that it should be informative of pose and not sensitive to things like the lighting or the clothing that they're wearing or the background and so forth. So we can take NCA, which we talked about before, and modify it ever so slightly to take into account 
the real valued pose label. So for this example, we got head and hand locations. And we measure the hands relative to the head. So we have 60 vectors, which represent our labels. So we no longer have discrete classes anymore. And what NCA is going to do in this case, we call it NCA regression, it's going to pull together points that are in similar pose because they get penalized. If we put high probability of being a neighbor based on the distance to some you know, two images that are really far away in pose space, that's a bad thing, right? So we pay a cost for that. So, and then we just go and minimize this thing with respect to our, our mapping. We learn the mapping that way. OK, so we collected a data set using Ian's tool, um, basically by digitally recording all the speakers at the 2010 Snowbird workshop, and then sent these off to Turks after each session of talk. So by the end of the workshop, uh, we were able to have everything labeled and do an analysis of the body language. Um, and we compared several approaches. You know, we have baselines like pixel-based, uh, just comparing distances in pixel space, which is not really a practical thing to do, uh, using global descriptors like GIST, using linear variants of the NCA objective, using a convolutional net to do the mapping, but using the NCA regression objective. And then we basically have a version of Dr. Lim that takes into account the, the soft pose-based distances instead of the, the neighborhood graph. And, um, it works reasonably well. So you can see query images here, and then returning the nearest neighbors. And the first nearest neighbor under our methods, so we basically have like the, the NCA variant and the Dr. Lim variant, um, it works reasonably well. It gets you back um, other people. So I should say that the training set and the test set are totally different groups of people. So we'll always return a different people person, but it will generally be in a different pose. And you'll see that just the global descriptor and pixels um, work uh, not so not so well. It generally matches things like the background, which is which is what we would expect with the lighting conditions and so forth. So even though we've trained the model only on head and, and hand locations, it seems to capture something more substantial about overall body pose. But we haven't quantified that. We've only um, been able to measure distances in terms of what were labeled, which were the head and hands. But quantitatively, you know. On the synthetic data set we tested it on, and the real valued snowboard data set, generally this shows you the radius of error we get. So our best performing method gets about 25.4 uh, pixel error, which means like you get the hand within this radius on average. And on the real uh, data set, we get our, the hand within this 16.4 pixel uh, radius. OK, so this is all, um, all good. but. It's still kind of annoying to ask people on Mechanical Turk to go out and label people's head and hands. So can we do something um, that doesn't involve asking people to provide explicit labels? And we can. So here's the idea. We're going to use um, an, an idea uh, that's based on imitation. So people are really good at imitating uh, other people's poses. So if you show someone an image, you can then go through and have people try to do the same pose. And if you go and ask a lot of people to do this, this is exactly the type of data set that you're interested in. Because you're getting all kinds of different backgrounds, all kinds of different clothing and lighting and, and so forth. But they're people essentially in the same pose. And there's like shift and scale invariance. And this is all the types of invariances you want to um, make your embedding uh, pick up. So. Um, Basically, what we're going to do is exploit the abundance of webcams on the internet and also people's willingness to share images and video of themselves and do what we call active crowdsourcing. So instead of having people you know, do segmentation or, or pose labels or, or labeling for classification, we say it's active because they're, they're contributing images of themselves. OK, so there's a question of how do we actually select the images that people are asked to imitate. Um, and we're going to use this idea of temporal coherence in video. So the, this idea called temporal coherence is the idea that successive frames in a video sequence usually are similar in content to one another. I'll use this example to show you that if I send out a video you know, and ask people to imitate the frames of that video, two successive frames are generally somewhat close in terms of their pose. So basically, we're going to take a video, chop it up in two frames. People are going to provide one or more or no imitations per frame. 
get a variable number of imitations per frame. And we're going to assume that if people are cooperating, all of these images should be similar to one another because they're mimicking the same pose. But also, you know, neighboring seed frames that have given Im imitations, those imitations should be somewhat similar. Right? And that similarity should sort of fall off with increasing frame di distance. All right, so we're going to try to uncover this sort of underlying post manifold. We're just basically assuming that not only the seed images, but also the imitations come from some underlying, underlying pose manifold. And that's what we're going to try to recover with our mapping. So the codes we produce from our mapping are going to be pose sensitive and ignore all the other junk going on in the images. So we don't actually learn on these video uh, seed images, only the imitations. OK, so to formalize the problem, we're going to learn a mapping. You've seen this before. We're going to use a convolutional net to map images to codes. And this mapping could be linear or nonlinear. And the mapping is going to be used so, such that if the images come from nearby seed frames, then we want their distance and pose in, in the embedded space to be small. Right? Otherwise, we want it to be large. So here's an example of some images that have come from an imitation. And uh, they, have the same, they come from the same frame. And so y here is going to represent what frame they, they originally came from. And they should be similar. So this only requires a slight modification to Dr. Lim. Instead of having binary indicator variables, we make, sorry, we make um, s be a real valued quantity that's indicated of how similar the input should be. And that's going to be based on their distance and frame space. Right? And then for images that come from different scenes, we're going to just treat them as dissimilar. So basically, we don't have graded dissimilarity, just graded similarity. And then we're going to apply the doctor limb as, as normal. It's just scaled by the similarity. OK, so how do we map frame number to similarity score? We're just going to normalize it. There's various things you could do. We've tried a few different takes on this. But we find that this simple mapping where you just get the absolute frame diff distance between the imitations um, at once, so you don't divide by 0, and then invert it, that just gives uh, something that works fairly well. So basically, everybody that's uh, Im our imitations corresponding to the same frame, they should be maximally similar. Imitations corresponding to neighboring frames, they have similarity of one half. And then two away, you have similarity of one third and so forth, right? And so just going back to the convolutional net, just to remind you, this is what we're learning. We're learning the parameters in this neural net, basically two sets of identical neural nets that are trained by backprop. But it's a different objective than a normal backprop sort of classification style convolutional neural net. We want it to take pairs of inputs, and if they come, if they're imitations from nearby frames, we want them to have similar codes at the output layer, right? And if they're in different scenes altogether and correspond, assumingly, to totally different poses, then we want them to produce codes that are far away. OK, so something really interesting happened. Um, when we were thinking about these types of models and how we could do this, uh, we were, it was time to start data collection, and we were going to crowdsource it, asking people to imitate. And then I received a Google slide deck of interesting applications of crowdsourcing. And in that slide deck was a Dutch progressive electro band named Simon and Kipsky, who had basically already done all of our data collection for us. So that was rather fortunate. And um, they have this music video called One Frame of Fame. The idea is that the band is aiming to uh, basically substitute frames from other people into their video. So they have this website set up. You can go take a picture of yourself, um, you know, upload it to the bands, and then they're going to insert your frame of you copying one of the band's frames. Um, and they rebuild it like every hour. So they had um, something like 35 thousand contributions to date. When we started working with it, it had about 30,000 30, contributions. So basically, one other cool thing about this is that the band in the file names, um, basically, uh, the file names were based on the frame, the original frame number. So this gave us the correspondence. I'll just turn up my laptop. The, point, the, the important part is the, the visual. So come on, give you a count off, and the rest of you guys come over here when I take it. Okay, so this is the band right here. 
So I'm not going to play the whole video because it's going to take up my talk. But um, I think you probably get the idea. So people have done the data collection, the imitation for us. Um, we know what frame the imitations came from. And this uh, gives you an idea of what the data set kind of looks like. So there are originally about 6,000 frames in the entire uh, music video. And this shows how many imitations were collected for each frame. So um, basically, the blue is a test set we use. Um, the, the red is a training set. And we see that we have something like, um, you know, on average, something like 15 or 12 um, imitations per frame. Sometimes we have as many as 40 imitations for a given frame. And there are blocks of the video, as you just saw, in which there are no imitations. So I guess for artistic reasons or whatever, the band has decided that they want themselves present in that portion of the video. Um, so you know there are blocks where there's no imitations. Um, OK. So how do we measure our performance here? Well, we're going to use um, an image retrieval metric called discounted cumulative gain. And the idea here is that um, a user will submit a query. So this is an image that the network has never seen before. And we're going to return the nearest neighbors, as found by our embedding. Right? So we're going to put all these guys through the neural net. This will produce codes associated with each image. And so we're going to compute distances in this learned code space. And we want, basically, the query to have sort of a goodness. Or the return results to have sort of a goodness when compared to the query. How do we come up with goodness? Well, this is based on the frame number. So you know, all the images, we know which original frame they came from, even the test ones, too. So we can evaluate it by seeing if it returns frames that are close to the query. Now, that's just really a proxy for us to judge whether it's getting sort of uh, semantically similar uh, matching. We can also visually evaluate it, but this gives us something quantitative. And basically, in DCG, it has a term down here which basically says something like, oh, the third result returned is not as important as the first result, or the tenth result returned is not as important as the first. Okay? So that's why it's discounted. So um, you know, we, we consider a fixed number of matches, 5 or 10 or 12. And we're going to use, um, I should say that you know, the, the, the similarity that we use in our model is just going to be the same as sort of the goodness. right? We're just measuring the distance um, between the results and, and our, our query. OK, so we can use this method we've uh, proposed as soft similarity score. This basically is maximally similar at, your, at, at imitations that are from the same frame. And this falls off um, for, for frames that are far away. We can also use something that's sort of between discrete sort of Dr. Lim style matching and this soft similarity, which is a block. So basically, put a, put a fixed window of maximum similarity around, say, uh, your, your 10 neighboring frames. So we try that as well. And so we see that generally, if we're using the soft type of similarity, um, we do much better. Um, we have a baseline, which is basically using global descriptors plus a linear mapping. Um, and that does not work very well at all, as expected. It doesn't really have any information about um, which frames the imitations came from. And then we see that sort of lying in the middle are um, the block structured uh, type of our method and sort of like uh, the standard Dr. Lim setup where we would just define um, neighborhoods to be guys in the same uh, corresponding to the same frame alone and not having this sort of similarity that spreads out. Perhaps more interesting is the actual qualitative matches. So it actually does a really uh, reasonable job of finding neighbors. So the leftmost column are basically um, query images. And then we have the nearest neighbors returned. And you see it will be able to tell if someone has their palm forward or the back of their hand forward. Um, it will definitely. It seems to have acquired some sort of scale invariance you see in these examples. Um, it doesn't always match perfectly. Uh, like that's that's a mistake there. Um, but you know, it knows whether so, it, it can deal with people wearing sunglasses. It can usually get like one finger versus a whole hand. Um, it even seems to get th very subtle things like uh, people barring their teeth. Doesn't care that this guy has a cat with him. 
Um, you see that some people have actually uploaded pictures of hands or drawings of hands. <laughs> And it uh, matches to those two, to, to real hands. And those drawings actually kind of look like hands. So it's kind of learned sort of like an invariance to, to um, natural or non-natural hands. Um, yeah, so it, it does reasonably well. And then we took it a little st another step further and tried to do face detection with this thing. And uh, basically, we had people label bounding boxes um, for the training set. And we created a test set as well with some actual bounding boxes. And so now we just use our same method to find nearest neighbors. You query image. Um, you retrieve a certain number of nearest neighbors. They all have bounding boxes associated with them. And then you apply the median bounding box. And so you get a detection for your unlabeled um, or your, your, your query that doesn't have a, a bounding box. And um, you know, we score this by basically using the intersection over union score which uh, just takes the intersection between the, the retrieved and the true bounding box and divides it by the union. Um, and we tested against PitPat, which is a very good commercial uh, face detector, which I believe they've been bought by Google now, and OpenCV, which has the Viola Jones uh, face detector. And it's known not to be the greatest face detector in the world, but it's, it's popular. And we find that actually we're outperforming using this sort of non-parametric face detection by doing nearest neighbor matching. We're actually doing better um, than PitPat for, I should qual you know, qualify this by saying it's for uh, this domain of, of webcam-based images, right? Um, if we took this outside and, and, and went to more general settings, it probably wouldn't work as well. So you see it, um, you know, PitPat failing in certain settings where people have occlusions or wearing glasses or have turned their uh, faces and and we're actually succeeding in the in these types of difficult settings. Um, okay, so basically, I told you a little bit about unsupervised similarity matching, so semantic hashing. Um, this is where you don't have any information to inform your embedding at all, and it's 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 good for certain situations, but often you have either some labels attached to your data set or you have some external information available. So if you have explicit information, like labels or a neighborhood graph, you can use this information and learn your embedding in a supervised manner. And I think the more interesting setting is a completely um, uh, unlabeled, like no explicit labels, but weakly supervised setting, where maybe you can exploit something like temporal coherence to inform your embedding. And I showed you a simple um, extension of Dr. Lim that can use temporal coherence to guide learning and produce a very good pose-sensitive um, embedding mechanism that uses a convolutional neural net. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Um, and uh, once again, I'll just starting a new group in Guelph, so I'll, I'll, I'll advertise that a little bit and I'd be happy to take your questions. <laughs>